Welcome back to the Farm Easy Tutor channel. My name is Ken Eto. Today in part two of the antibiotic lecture series, I'll be completing the discussion of gram-positive organisms. I'll cover more about MRSA and then talk about the two other major gram-positive groups of bacteria, Streptococcus and Enterococcus. Again, this tutorial lasts about 30 minutes, so if you'd like, you can take a pause about halfway through and then return to watch the rest of the 15 minutes. I'll try to make the material interesting so that the lecture will move along fairly quickly. I hope you continue to enjoy this series of tutorials. This is part two of the Antibiotics Made Simple lecture series. And in this section, we're going to complete the discussion of the rest of the gram-positive organisms. In the last episode, we talked all about Staph aureus that there are two types of Staph aureus, MSSA and MRSA. We discussed the treatment of hospital-acquired MRSA infections. And in this part, we're going to talk about the treatment of community-acquired MRSA. So we have some remaining questions to ask regarding MRSA. The first question is, do we use only one antibiotic to treat MRSA infections or should we use combination therapy? Should we add on more antibiotics to treat MRSA? And the answer is in general, monotherapy or one antibiotic is used to treat MRSA infections. However, combination therapy can be considered in the following situations. One, where you are considering treating more than just MRSA, where you have mixed infections. Two, where you have resistant MRSA bacteremia with persistent positive cultures. This is a situation where ceftaroline might be added to vanco or daptomycin therapy when either vanco or dapto are not effective enough. And the third case would be in endocarditis for prosthetic valve endocarditis only. This is where we'll be adding rifampin and genomycin to vancomycin. And for non-prosthetic valvular endocarditis, we don't recommend combination therapy, no additional genomycin and no additional rifampin. The next question is, when do we treat with vancomycin when we only suspect MRSA in a patient, but it's not yet documented on a culture? This is called empiric therapy, or your best guess as to what the organism is that the patient has based on their history and clinical presentation. And what's recommended is that patients at high risk for having an MRSA infection should be placed on empiric vancomycin upon admission to the hospital if their clinical condition warrants it. Now, who are these high risk patients for MRSA? Well, we can take a look at these types of patients. Most MRSA infections occur in patients who have been in the hospital or in nursing homes and dialysis centers. These are called healthcare associated MRSA infections or HA MRSA. Either patients that are in nursing homes or extended care facilities, patients who are receiving chronic dialysis within one month, patients who have been hospitalized for greater than 48 hours in the last three months or patients that have been previously on long courses of antibiotics, and patients who might have had multiple invasive lines such as IV lines or urinary catheters or currently have them. In these patients, we should consider ordering empiric vancomycin depending on their clinical status and need for antibiotic therapy. We talked about high-risk patients for MRSA in the previous slide, but there's a subgroup of patients who are at high risk of developing MRSA pneumonia. And this is called Healthcare Associated Pneumonia or HCAP. Whatever happened to that term? Well, HCAP is defined as pneumonia in non-hospitalized patients who are at increased risk of infection with MRSA. However, in 2016, IDSA, which is the Infectious Diseases Society of America, removed the term HCAP from their guidelines. When they looked at a meta-analysis of patients who met the criteria for HCAP, 
they found that these patients were not infected with MRSA, and their outcomes depended more on age and comorbidities rather than the multidrug resistant organisms that these patients had. Now let's talk a little bit about a different type of MRSA called Community Acquired MRSA, or CAMRSA. In the mid-1990s, MRSA infections began showing up in individuals who were not in contact with the healthcare system. And this was a different kind of MRSA that we saw in the community, and it affected normally healthy people. It often began as a painful skin boil, which was often misdiagnosed as a spider bite, and it was easily spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. It could advance in some cases to more serious infections such as sepsis, cellulitis, or abscess. And so a different category came up, which was community acquired MRSA. So we know that there's a potential of developing community acquired MRSA outside of the hospital. So who are the at risk populations for developing this? One would be Individuals that are in crowded conditions, like daycare centers and military training camps. Unsanitary conditions, individuals who are in jails, uh, certain locker rooms, and IV drug users. And sports, any type of contact sport, such as wrestling in high school. These are all at-risk populations for developing community-acquired MRSA. So how do we treat patients who have community-acquired MRSA? Well, luckily, community-acquired MRSA infections are typically not multi-resistant, and they're much easier to treat with more conventional antibiotics compared to MRSA infections that are in the hospital. So community-acquired MRSA infections often maintain susceptibility to doxycycline, 100 milligrams, PO twice a day, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or ceftribactrim, one to two double strength tablets twice a day orally, or clindamycin 300 to 450 milligrams PO three times a day. And for trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and clindamycin, use the higher dosage if the BMI of the patient is greater than 40. So now we completed our discussion about staph aureus, and now we're going to move on to discuss a different type of staph named coagulase negative staph. Coagulase negative staph, or CONS, is less virulent than staph aureus, but it still can cause serious infections. Now when we look at the table, we see staphylococcus as a group, the coagulase positive group includes Staph aureus, MSSA, and MRSA, and this group is more virulent and causes more severe infections. The other group, coagulase negative, includes three types of staph, epidermidis, hemolyticus, and saprophyticus. Coagulase negative staph is less virulent, but again, it can still cause serious infections. Coagulase is an enzyme that's needed to make blood clots. So let's talk a little bit about the background of coag-negative staph infections. Coag-negative staph commonly lives on a person's skin, and it's part of the normal human skin flora. However, medical or surgical procedures in the hospital can introduce coag-negative staph into a patient's body. It can then cause serious infections when present in the bloodstream or in large amounts. Now, patients who are at greatest risk for coag-negative staph infections include those patients who have internal devices. This includes patients who have central lines, Foley catheters, who have had joint replacement surgery, such as in the shoulder, the hip, or the knee, or patients who have pacemakers implanted. How do we treat coag-negative staph infections? Coag-negative staph infections are treated with vancomycin. Why vancomycin? 
because 70 to 90 percent of coag-negative staph are resistant to the semi-synthetic penicillins, methicillin, and oxacillin. So unfortunately, whenever we get infection with coag-negative staph, we need to resort to using vancomycin. Also, when treating prosthetic valve endocarditis or prosthetic joint infection caused by coag-negative staph, we need to add rifampin and genomycin to the vancomycin. Another important point to remember about treating coag-negative staph infections is that if you get one out of two blood cultures that come back with coag-negative staph, this situation might reflect contamination and may not represent a true infection. So at this point, whenever you get only one out of two blood cultures that come back with coag-negative staph, you need to stop and ask yourself, does this infection warrant starting vancomycin or not? Now, coag-negative staph is considered a medium pathogenic staph. And so you need to look at the patient and consider the severity of the infection and the clinical condition of the patient before deciding on whether or not to start vancomycin in this patient. So remember, if you only have one out of two blood cultures that come back positive with coag-negative staph, you need to determine whether or not this is contamination or is it a true infection? Here's some additional information about the species of coag-negative staph. Now it's not important to memorize the names of these species because coag-negative staph is generally considered and discussed as a group. However, it is important to understand the concept of a biofilm because coag-negative staph has an association with biofilms and, and they actually create havoc in treating infections as we'll talk about in a minute. So what's a biofilm? Basically a biofilm is a conglomeration of polysaccharide material that forms a surface or a, a spot where bacteria can adhere to. The polysaccharide rich material then grows over the bacteria and the biofilm then makes it harder for the antibiotic to reach the bacteria to kill them. So here's a picture of the biofilm creation process. First, protein and carbohydrate attach to a certain surface, such as a catheter, a Foley catheter, or an indwelling central line catheter. Bacteria then adhere to the polysaccharide protein mix. And then the polysaccharide rich material grows over the bacteria, forming this biofilm, which creates an inaccessibility of the antibiotics to reach it and therefore protects the bacteria and prolongs the infection. Now, these types of infections are very difficult to treat. That's one of the reasons why we need to treat endocarditis for long periods of time. And when we also need to increase our vancomycin levels to achieve success. We've now completed our discussion about Staphylococcus. And now we're going to be moving on to discuss Streptococcus. Streptococcus is the second main group under gram-positive cocci, and it's comprised of four important species that we'll talk about each one in a minute. How do we classify Streptococcus species? Well, they're either alpha hemolytic or beta hemolytic, and this depends on what effect it has when the bacteria is grown on blood agar. This helps us further differentiate the strep species that we're trying to identify. Alpha hemolytic species shows incomplete hemo hemolysis of red blood cells on blood agar. The iron in the hemoglobin oxidizes to a product called biliverdin, giving it a greenish color. So when this happens, we know that it's either strep pneumoniae or strep viridans. On the other hand, beta hemolytic species cause complete hemolysis of red cells when the bacteria is grown on blood agar. These produce wide zones of clear hemolysis around each colony, 
and a, an enzyme called streptolysin is produced by the bacteria which causes the hemolysis. Now, when this happens, we know the bacteria is either strep pyogenes or strep agalactiae. One important point about beta hemolytic species is that it is there are 21 serotypes in this group and they're identified by letter. It's called Lancefield grouping and it's based on the specific carbohydrates that are present in the cell wall. But really out of the 21 serotypes, there are only really two types, strep pyogenes or group A strep and strep a galactiae or group B strep out of the 21 that are of really clinical significance. As a side note, there was a group D strep category called strep but in 1984 it was reclassified into a separate genus named Enterococcus. We'll first talk about the alpha hemolytic strep. In alpha hemolytic strep, there are two in that group strep pneumoniae and strep viridens. So strep pneumoniae is the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia cap. It can also cause otitis media, sinusitis, meningitis, and peritonitis. So it's frequently seen in human infections. This is the reason why we vaccinate the elderly and high risk patients with pneumococcal vaccine, either pneumovax or Prevnar. Now, when you're treating a strep pneumonia infection as an outpatient, we can use basic antibiotics that are related to penicillin, either amoxicillin uh, or even doxycycline and levofloxacin. However, for hospitalized patients who develop community acquired pneumonia, we need to expand our coverage because as you can see in the picture, we not only have streptococcus pneumoniae, but we have Haemophilus influenza. So we need to expand the coverage to use ceftriaxone, which is a third generation cephalosporin. We also need to expand therapy to add on for atypical coverage. So we add azithromycin to that group. So for hospitalized patients, we need to expand therapy. The second alpha hemolytic strep is strep viridens. Now, strep viridens inhabits the mouth of healthy people. But with people who have periodontal inflammation, it can get into the bloodstream and infect the heart valves, causing endocarditis. Now, how do we treat this endocarditis? Well, the strep viridens is exquisitely sensitive to penicillin, and so that's what we'll use, PEN-GK, 3 million units every four hours. Uh, alternatively, we can use ceftriaxone, two grams every day, and this is usually prolonged therapy for four weeks. Now, if we're dealing with prosthetic valve type endocarditis, we also need to add genomycin for a couple of weeks. Now we'll talk about the beta hemolytic strep, which includes group A strep or strep pyogenes and group B strep, strep A galactiae. A group A strep or strep pyogenes causes strep throat pharyngitis. About 5 to 20 percent of people have group A strep in their pharynx. Positive throat cultures occur in about 85 to 90 percent of cases. Strep pyogenes can also cause skin infections, including cellulitis, erysipelas, and impetigo. Now, one important point to remember about cellulitis: in most cases, if you have a staph cellulitis, it's usually purulent. If it's due to strep, it's usually non-purulent. So this affects how you will approach which antibiotics to use to treat the cellulitis. Now going back to strep pharyngitis, how do we treat that? Well, in these cases, penicillin, VK, or amoxicillin can be used. So the strep pyogenes is exquisitely sensitive to penicillin. If you have a penicillin allergy, you can use a third generation oral cephalosporin 
either cefdenir or cefpodoxime. Clindamycin can also be used or azithromycin. For cellulitis, either IV penicillin or oral penicillin or some of the first generation cephalosporins can be used. Now, strep pyogenes can also cause severe infections, including pneumonia, bacteremia, and even toxic shock syndrome. But the infection to remember the most is that strep pyogenes or group A strep can cause necrotizing fasciitis or flesh-eating bacteria. Now, this is a very serious infection of the deep soft tissue and involves the fascia. It is a life-threatening emergency and because it has a potential for widespread tissue destruction and even sepsis. These are usually mixed anaerobic infections and it's seen commonly in diabetic patients. Now, how do we treat necrotizing fasciitis? Well, again, this is an emergency situation and initially we don't know what bacteria are causing the infection. And so we need to treat aggressively with empiric antibiotics that are extremely broad spectrum. So we'll load on the antibiotics because we think that it's polymicrobial. Vancozosin or vanco with a carbapenem or even vanco and ceftriaxone and metronidazole. This therapy covers gram-positive anaerobes and gram-negatives. And so it covers most of the common bacteria that are out there. Now, once your cultures come back, and if you find out that the necrotizing fasciitis is solely due to strep pyogenes, then we can de-escalate therapy and switch it to penicillin GK, three to four million units every four hours, which is high dose penicillin, plus adding on clindamycin 900 milligrams every six hours. Now clindamycin is added to suppress the streptococcal cytokine and toxin production. The toxins are what causes the skin necrosis. So strep pyogenes have a, has a wide scope of causing infections. The most important one, both strep throat pharyngitis and necrotizing fasciitis. The second beta hemolytic strep is called group B strep, GBS, or strep A galactiae. Now group B strep is the most common cause of meningitis in infants from one to three months old. Group B strep colonizes the intestines and the female reproductive tract, and it can be spread to newborns through vaginal secretions during delivery. Strep A galactiae is the most common cause of neonatal sepsis, pneumonia, and meningitis in newborns and adults can also experience certain types of infections. We need to prevent this from happening, and so it's recommended that all pregnant women between 35 to 37 weeks gestation to be tested for GBS. Women who test positive should be given prophylactic antibiotics, and they should receive either penicillin or ampicillin during delivery. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about Enterococcus. Enterococcus is the third main group under gram-positive cocci. Here are some key facts about Enterococcus. As we mentioned before, in 1984, beta-hemolytic strep group D was assigned to a new genus named Enterococcus. Now this includes Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus faecium. Enterococci are normal intestinal flora, and they can cause a wide variety of infections, including bacteremia, endocarditis, intra-abdominal and pelvic infections, urinary tract infections, cellulitis, and wound infections. The important point to remember about Enterococcus is that they are intrinsically resistant to many commonly used antimicrobial agents compared to streptococci. So they are kind of like an inexclusive in club. Now here's an important chart to remember that differentiates the two species of Enterococcus. Enterococcus faecalis is more common 
and it's less virulent and less resistant to antibiotics. However, Enterococcus fecium is less common, more virulent, and more resistant to antibiotics. They tend to be more in the category of VRE, which is vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So enterococcus fecium has developed mechanisms of resistance against vancomycin. Luckily, it's less common, but it's still out there and we need to develop strategies to kill it. So how do we treat enterococcus? Well, I have two slides. The first slide has to do with treating mild to moderate infections. And as you can see, enterococcus faecalis has, and also enterococcus faecium, is in a special VIP club. They are exclusive because they don't really have that many antibiotics that are out there that can treat them. So for intra-abdominal infections, and uncomplicated wound infections. The drug of choice is ampicillin. And alternatively, if ampicillin resistance occurs, then you can use ampicillin subactam. If the patient has a penicillin allergy, then we would treat that with vancomycin. So those are really the only two choices that are out there. Um, other types of and other antibiotics, such as tigacycline and daptomycin, has been used for higher level penicillin resistance. For urinary tract infections, nitrofrantone is probably the drug to use. Alternatively, phosphomycin oral monoral is the name of the antibiotic, and levofloxacin can also be used. Now, when we talk about enterococcus faecium, we're talking more about treating vancomycin resistant enterococcus or VRE. And here, there aren't really too many choices. We can use linazolid, or we can use a product named quinupristin, dolphopristin, or synersid. Synersid is a very expensive drug, and its use is primarily for VRE. It's not approved for MRSA. And it's given as a Q8 or Q12 hour regimen. For urinary tract, urinary tract infections, nitrofurantoin is used and can be used for VRE infections. Daptomycin is an alternative, but its use in VRE urinary tract infections is unapproved. When we talk about serious infections in critically ill patients, usually these patients have sepsis, endocarditis, meningitis, osteomyelitis, or severe joint infections. Again, we have very limited antibiotics that are available to use to treat against Enterococcus faecalis and faecium. So again, it's in this VIP category. Now, Enterococcus faecalis causes 97% of enterococcal and endocarditis. And this organism does form the biofilm that we talked about in earlier slides. It forms a biofilm at about 90% of the time, so it's very difficult to treat. The primary treatment for endocarditis is ampicillin, two grams every four hours, combined with gentamicin. If the patient is penicillin allergic, we would use vancomycin plus gentamicin. And these regimens are for four to six weeks. Now, an off-asked question is, what type of dose do we use for genomycin? The genomycin for synergy dose is what we'd recommend. We should give it in multiple daily doses, not once a day dosing, and we should shoot for peaks of three micrograms per mil and troughs less than one. Now, high level genomycin resistance has occurred, and so alternative treatments have been clinically uh, studied and investigated. And probably the, the most common or useful combination therapy is ampicillin, two grams every four hours, combined with ceftriaxone, two grams every 12 hours. And this is effective in both genomycin-resistant and genomycin-sensitive uh, isolates in both not a native and prosthetic valve infections. 
high dose daptomycin, 8 to 10 milligram per kilogram a day in the treatment of enterococcal endocarditis has been also investigated. Uh, however, it is not FDA approved. When we talk about Enterococcus faecium, or VRE, the biofilm only occurs in about 15 to 30 percent of the time. The primary treatment is the same as for mild to moderate infections, either linazolid or quinupristin dolphopristin. And so many people have investigated other types of alternatives to use for VRE. However, when you look at daptomycin, it really has no indication for any VRE infection. There have been reports of clinical failures and emergence of resistance during therapy. However, if you do choose to use daptomycin against VRE, you may need to use a combination therapy of ampicillin or ceftaroline and use higher doses of daptomycin, either 10 to 12 milligram per kilogram every 24 hours. Tigacycline has also been suggested to be used against VRE severe infections. However, due to its rapid movement from the bloodstream into tissues after administration, the blood levels achieved are low, so it's not effective for bloodstream infections. Urinary concentrations are also low, so it's not effective against urinary tract infections. So we've talked a lot about the gram-positive cocci, but let's not forget to mention the gram-positive bacilli. The gram-positive bacilli group comprise of three bacteria, which are not as common as gram-positive cocci, but can still cause significant infection in humans. Listeria monocytogenes can cause serious food poisoning with resultant meningitis. Outbreaks in the United States have been caused by contaminated sprouts, cantaloupe, deli meats. It's also found in soft cheeses and unpasteurized milk. For patients that develop significant infection and meningitis, the treatment is high-dose ampicillin plus or minus genomycin. Corinibacterium diphtheriae causes diphtheria, which we know is a respiratory illness. It's generally have been prevented with the use of immunization with DPT vaccine. Bacillus anthracis can cause anthrax, which was talked about after 9-11 when it was thought to be used as a biologic weapon. In this case, airspace is contaminated with aerosolized anthrax. Now, to prophylax against bacillus, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, or ceftriaxone can be used. Congratulations! You successfully completed part two of four parts. You're adding knowledge to becoming competent with antibiotics. And look what your learning has continued to do to Mr. Bacterium. So this completes the review of gram-positive organisms and their antibiotics of choice. Please join me next time in part three of this lecture series, where I'll be taking a closer look at anaerobes and atypical bacteria. Thanks for tuning in to watch this episode of the Farm Easy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use in practice or at school. There was a lot of material presented and it does take time to study all the information. If you would like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube and to stay informed when the latest material is available to view, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.